Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out and uh, braving the weather. I'm sure we'll have a few stragglers, including a few panelists, who'll be joining us in just a few minutes. My name's Tom Banshoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center here, Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this conference on liberty and tolerance in an age of religious conflict. Uh, in a minute, you'll get to hear from Kelly Clark of Calvin College, our partner and the really the driving force uh, behind this conference. But I thought I'd give you a little background about Georgetown University and about the center before handing things over to him. Georgetown, as many of you know, uh, is the oldest Catholic and Jesuit university in the United States, founded in 1789. And the topic of our conference, liberty, tolerance, religion, it's not only extremely relevant in the context of the anniversary of September 11th, it also really links back to Georgetown's mission as a Catholic and Jesuit university, which from the very beginning has been open to other faith traditions and to the wider secular world. We're here in Washington, D.C., so we're very attuned to the political and public policy aspects uh, of these topics. And Georgetown, of course, has a wide network of partner institutions and activities around the world, so the global dimension is very important. Those of you who know Georgetown know that there are a number of centers and institutes on campus that look at issues at this intersection of religion, interreligious dialogue, peace, world affairs. The Berkeley Center is one of the younger ones. We've been around for about five years now. We're uh, located in the office of the president, and the idea is to really network some of the existing efforts and kickstart a conversation across the disciplines, especially the social science disciplines, um, about how religion intersects with different dimensions of world affairs, with uh, issues of democracy and development, uh, with issues of peace and interreligious dialogue, which will be our focus today. So there's a little bit of background about what we're doing. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. I'm especially delighted that Kelly brought this project to my attention about a year ago and that we're able to host this conference, which as I said, uh, he's really organized from start to finish. So with that, Kelly. Thank you, Tom, and thanks to the Berkeley Center for uh, being such a warm co-host for the conference. Uh, stop me if you've heard this one. Jesus, Muhammad, uh, and Abraham were out golfing, and uh, oh wait, there's, there's no way to go for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, my wife told me not to tell this joke, so, uh, so I'm going to stop. My wife, my wife tells me other things, too, and, and the, the joke start reminds me that uh, if I were to tell that, there'd be no way to win. Um, you're all, were probably cringing, waiting for some cultural stereotype. Uh, you were all waiting to be on the receiving end of the cultural stereotype, uh, perhaps, uh, and you were all probably thinking, do I laugh politely at someone who tells a joke like that at this sort of conference? And um, uh, part of the reason I decided to start this way is because pro probably some of us are going to misspeak about some things. Here we are talking about religious liberty and tolerance. We're trying to talk together, and there are things we don't understand about each other. We have stereotypes of one another. Um, and it might be that it's OK on occasion just to tolerate one another's missteps um, uh, as, we, as we try to work together uh, in defense of religious liberty and tolerance and to do it with uh, good humor. Uh, Lord knows, no pun intended, uh, each of our religions has done things that we better um, sometimes just laugh at. And that may be something that we need to do here. It may, need to t it may need to be the kind of tenor that we have to have as we dialogue about this together. That said, my, my wife also has told me that um, only she gets to laugh at her father uh, and criticize her father. Um, Lord knows again that her father has a lot to criticize and to laugh at, but only my wife and her um, siblings get to criticize her father and get to laugh at him. And sometimes um, we need to uh, realize that in our criticisms of, of other religions, it's just not our place to do that. 
and I know some folks here will be critical of their own religion, and that's more their job than my, than my job. Uh, or, or, uh, people need to look self-critically at their own and raise comments and criticisms, and people have done that uh, in this conference. Uh, uh, sorry, in the essays that were written for this conference. About three years ago, I was in Oxford at a conference, and the conference was really boring, and I, I've become increasingly aware of how irrelevant most of philosophy is. The average article in philosophy gets read by 1.47 people, and in my case, one of those people was my mother. Uh, so by philosophers, about 0.47 read my published work. Um, and, I, and I thought, and I'd published on religious liberty and tolerance from a Christian perspective. And I became increasingly concerned about this issue. I think it's next to say global warming. Um, it's probably the biggest topic and most serious problem that our world faces in the 21st century. How, how can we get along in an increasingly globalized uh, world but when we have such serious disagreements and such serious disagreements that people want to resolve sometimes with violence. Um, and I also, and so I was working on this at Oxford, I also was finishing a book in response to Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion and in that book he talks a lot about religious religiously motivated violence. And Dawkins is sure that he understands the source of religiously motivated violence. It's religion. Religion in every guise. It, it's religion that's particularly suited to, to trigger that, that sort of irrationality that moves people into violence. Now to me that's an empirical question. Is, is religion likely to make us more violent? And Dawkins is a scientist, so I don't think he's very self-critical in his approach. I think he just, he uses a lot of anecdotes and we've given him no end of anecdotes um, in terms of religiously at least inspired and directed violence throughout human history. And he said he took the gloves off after 9-11 and instead of just being a sort of mild critic of religion, he's going to be an open, outspoken, hostile critic of religion after 9-11. And there are a lot of people, Christopher uh, Hitchens, Sam Harris, and others, who think we need, to, we need to get rid of religion because religion is particularly um, liable to violence. Um, I thought the empirical question wasn't so clear. Um, it's not so clear to me what exactly inspires people to violence. It's not exactly clear, say, um, in the Crusades, if it's blind ambition and greed that moves kings to mobilize people in support of their uh, secular ambitions, that uses religion to just mobilize people um, in support of uh, that king's own secular ambitions. So I'm not sure what it is that motivates people, but I am sure that religion gets channeled somehow into violence. And so I thought what we need to do is to um, gather together a group of writers who would think of um, religiously motivated peace, justice, and tolerance. And to draw on the best resources of their own traditions and um, develop those in support of liberty and tolerance. And uh, all of you have the list of authors that um, have come together. The, the book is done. It's at Yale University Press. Uh, it will be published next spring. And we thought we'd have a conference in conjunction with 9-11 to come together and, um, and to think together uh, from our own traditions uh, about religious liberty and tolerance. I'll just say two quick things and then we'll move into the program. I thought because we're Abraham's children there would be some things that we shared and that we should, um, we should think about those. There, there have to be beliefs about God. Uh, there have to be values, God-given values that we share Muslims, Christians, and Jews that might be exploited in defense of religious liberty and tolerance. But I also thought there would be things that we didn't share. And so my project isn't to say we all worship the same God, we all believe the same thing, we all have the same salvific paths. We don't. We have radically different beliefs. And that's part of the problem. And it, and it creates a problem and a burden when people radically disagree 
about the nature of ultimate reality and about the nature of salvation and about the nature of the next life and about the nature of how to live this life. Um, and so I wanted us to think not just some sort of, um, you know, can't, why can't we all just get along, we all worship the same God. Um, that's, that's part of what I wanted us to think about. But also, even though we really deeply, seriously disagree, can we find a way for all of us to respect, honor, and encourage liberty and tolerance among believers, even though we really seriously disagree? And so I was looking for um, religiously particular defenses of religious liberty and tolerance. So I looked for values that we shared and values that we may not share, the particular values of Christianity or Islam or Judaism that might motivate um, adherence of those various religions to be tolerant and um, to enhance liberty even though people have deep disagreements about it. Um, that's what motivated the pro uh, project and you'll get to see uh, its fruition um, over the course of the day. Thank you all for coming and uh, I hope you profit as I will from this conference. All right, thank you very much, Kelly, and now we can dive right into the material. Just a word about how we're organizing things. The trick, as, as Kelly mentioned, is to make a conference exciting, and that means where you've got papers uh, as background, to use those papers as a jumping off point for, for a conversation. And so we've modeled the conference on the book in one way in that there's a panel on each of the Abrahamic traditions and their perspectives on these questions. But we thought rather than just hear papers from everyone, we would highlight uh, three keynote speakers to help frame raw debates, one from each tradition. We heard from Nick Woltersdorf last night speaking out of Christianity. And we'll have two more keynotes uh, today. Uh, and then invite a couple of the other authors for some briefer remarks up on the panel, responding maybe to the keynote, uh, but also addressing some core questions that we asked all of the panelists and presenters to think about. And I'll just uh, read those questions for you now to keep them in mind and to try to, not to discipline our discussion, but to focus it and give it some structure. So the questions we've asked our panelists to reflect on, uh, and these link back, I think, to the themes that Kelly laid out, are first, historically, how has your tradition been exploited by opponents of religious liberty and tolerance? Does such exploitation persist? I suppose we should say how and why does such exploitation persists today. And then second, uh, in a more optimistic direction, what are the major resources within your tradition supportive of religious liberty and tolerance? And I think this is also important uh, in an era where Dawkins and others find such wide resonance. What do those religious perspectives add to the dominant secular human rights discourse? And finally, and this is more of an action point, uh, which we want to reflect on, how can interfaith dialogue and activism advance the liberty and tolerance agenda, and what dangers and pitfalls do you see along the way? So those are some framing questions. We're going to leave time at the end of the formal presentation, the follow-on comments by the other panelists for a wider conversation uh, with you, and uh, we hope to build on some themes throughout the day. So that's just a general introduction. I'm going to be moderating the first panel on Muslim perspectives. And I'd like now to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. There's a brief biography on the back of the panel. I'm sorry, the back of the program of all the panelists. But a few words about Hedia Miramadi, who we're delighted to have here, uh, and who's going to uh, speak on religious liberty in Islam as a way of introducing some of these wider themes. Uh, Hedia Miramadi is an attorney, author, and founder and president of the World Organization for Resource Development and Education, an NGO which works to improve communication and relations between Muslim and non-Muslim communities. She's a scholar as well, uh, editor of several books, including Islam and Civil Society and In the Shadow of Saints, and she serves as a member of the all-female Shura Council of the Women's Islamic Initiative in Spirituality and Equality. She studied Islamic law in the Sufi tradition and also has a JD from the University of Southern California. Hedia, thanks for being with us.
Thank you all for braving the weather today and coming out. I, I don't know where my co-panelists are, but I'm hoping they're going to help me carry the rest of this, <laughs> this, this session this morning. Oh, there she is. Fantastic. <laughs> OK. <laughs> don't worry. We're here together. Fantastic. I would also like to thank the Georgetown University's Berkeley Center and the Templeton Foundation for hosting us today to celebrate this very important topic of religious liberty especially on the eve of the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I also want to give special thanks to Dr. Kelly, who had a vision for this book and brought it into a reality. Thank you. And all my co-authors, thank you as well. When I think about religious liberty in Islam, I'm reminded of a story we are taught in Islam about the prophet Abraham and the Zoroastrian. It is a wonderful example of how our faith teaches us to honor one another, regardless of our religious traditions. And the story goes like this. The prophet Abraham never liked to eat alone. He felt that food was a divine blessing and as such should be shared with others, especially those in need. Therefore, he made it a constant practice before a meal he would invite someone to eat with him. Abraham invited one day a fire worshiper to have a meal with him. And on sitting down to eat, Abraham asked him to begin in God's name and to recite, in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. The Zoroastrian said, you want to buy religion with one meal? I'm a fire worshiper. Why must I take God's name? Oh, this shocked Abraham, who preached of the one God. And while this person wanted to eat in the name of his fire, unable to tolerate the idolatry, Adam, Abraham asked the man to leave his table, and the man did. The Lord immediately sent a revelation to Abraham and saying, for the past 90 years, this man has not taken my name at all. And despite that, I have been feeding him without fail, and yet you found it difficult to feed him a single meal. Regardless of whether he takes my name at all, you cannot eat until you bring him back and make him happy. The story highlights so much of what I find true and beautiful in Islam. In portraying Abraham as an exemplar of good behavior, it connects Islam to the teachings of the previous prophets and religions. I find that much of Islam's teachings are like this, incorporating the story stories of earlier prophets and messengers and saintly figures to illustrate a moral lesson or a solution to an ethical dilemma. The story also demonstrates the importance of generosity, humility, hospitality, and most importantly, the ideal of self-sacrifice in Islam. For us today, we would, it would be very difficult to consider inviting a stranger to a meal and letting him into our home. Yet Abraham refused to take part in one without finding someone to share it with. But the most significant part of the story is the emphasis of going beyond tolerance in our everyday ethical behaviors and striving to reach acceptance of one another, a distinction that is a fundamental part of religious liberty and a cohesive society. As the story so aptly portrays, God in his divine wisdom creates all kinds of people. Some worship him, some worship others, and some don't worship at all. However, God doesn't withhold his divine gifts from any of them. He does not demand all of creation to accept a single faith, and so why would we? Modern day Muslim scholars often repeat, repeat the catchphrase, Islam tolerates other religions, but I believe this is an inadequate representation of the faith. Tolerate, as defined in the Webster Dictionary, is to endure, put up with, or to bear. And according to this definition, tolerance allows one to develop only a simple, simple or superficial relationship devoid of compassion, empathy, and mutual understanding. In true Islam, it's not sufficient to simply tolerate others. Rather, we must encourage Muslims in our faith to listen to and observe others so we truly understand them and accept them as part of, part of God's creation. Acceptance, more so than tolerance, is what breathes life into social structures, potentially shifting them from a stance of conflict to one of mutual respect. The injunction for acceptance was established when God said in the Holy Quran, the Holy Book of Muslims, O oh mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. This verse is generally the strongest affirmation of Islam's belief in the unity of mankind and the equality of each soul applying to both men and women, regardless of race or ethnicity. 
It emphasizes the true measure of the value of a person's wealth or status is his moral character and righteousness. The principle of human dignity and unity is often, is often emphasized repeatedly in the Quran. Another verse, now indeed we have honored the children of Adam and borne them over land and sea and provided them sustenance of the good things in life and favored them above most of our creation. Humankind, having been descended from a single father and mother, are unified at the root of tree of human existence. For that reason, Muslims believe that all humanity are brothers and sisters and that familiar relationship holds priority despite the material differences that exist. Therefore, it is clear that Islam did not intend to ban friendships with people of other faith, despite the misinterpretations for those who seek to isolate Muslims. On the contrary, there are countless stories of Muslims and non-Muslims living peacefully side by side. For example, Dr. Ahmed Al-Tayeb, the current head of Islam's most foremost institution in Egypt, known as Al-Azhar, narrates the following. Muslims have always coexisted with other religions, Christians and Jews in the western flank, and the Hindus and Buddhists in the eastern flank. One can always find examples for a bonding of people that springs from the inner gestures of humanity, deeply enriched by the life of faith. The relationship between Muslims and non-Muslim neighbors and fellow citizens must be one of courtesy, friendly social discourse, mutual welfare, and cooperation for the sake of righteousness. That is what true Islam calls for. Friendship should be afforded even to those who fought Muslims despite their enmity, for God says in the Quran, it may be that God will grant love and friendship between you and those who you now hold as enemies, for God has power over all things and God is oft forgiving and merciful. Because the Prophet Muhammad is the exemplar of conduct for Muslims, it is important to consider his relationship with people of other faith. A, a famous example is one day the funeral of a Jewish person was passing and the Prophet Muhammad stood up for it out of respect. Some of those present were surprised and said, well, why would you stand up and acknowledge a person that didn't even accept Islam as a religion? And the answer of the Prophet was, but is this not a human soul? This practical demonstration on the part of the Prophet of Islam signifies the equality of human beings. As the story illustrates right from the beginning, the Prophet did not treat the Jews as religious others. He tried to integrate them in a political community that was known as the Pact of Medina. The agreement was between the nascent Muslim community, the various Jewish tribes, and the pagan tribes. It should be noted that even the tribal other was considered an important constituent. The Pact of Medina drawn up by the Prophet himself demonstrates the notions of freedom, his spirit of inclusiveness, and his innovative approach to a modern and complex society. He described this community as the Ummah Wahida, which means the one community, while in other empires of that uh, at that same time, religious minorities were tolerated but were not given any political rights. In this document, the non-Muslims were given security rights equal to the other groups, as well as equal political and cultural rights equivalent to Muslims. Religious freedom was guaranteed and all groups were afforded self-governance and autonomy. Although some Muslim leaders have since deviated, and for a lot of them quite vastly, uh, from the Prophet's example over time, rulers within the Umayyad dynasty of Greater Syria, the Abbasid dyna dynasty of Baghdad and Cairo, the Mughals of Greater India, or the Sultanates of the Far East, they do have ex excellent examples of leaders who successfully govern diverse people with separate languages, cultures, and doctrinal beliefs. Their success lied in their commitment to learn from the nations over which Muslims held influence, and the various cultures were adapted and adopted instead of being destroyed. Having respect and acceptance of other faiths does not mean we will not disagree about matters of faith in society. However, traditional Islamic law and Quran reinforce the belief that this should not lead to violence. Traditionally, Muslims believe that it is better for mankind to pursue good deeds, to submit ourselves to the will of God, and to ab abide by the moral boundaries of social justice, and to let God ultimately decide matters of faith. There's a passage in the Quran where the prophet said, I believe what God has revealed of the book, and I'm commanded to do justice between you. God is our Lord and he is your Lord. For us, our deeds, and for you, your deeds. There is no contention between us and you. God will gather us together, and to him is the eventual return. 
Therefore, the commandment to avoid hostility and disagreement in faith is extremely clear. The real message of the Quran is to excel each other in good deeds. Unfortunately, people waste excessive time disputing with each other about beliefs rather than competing in acts of kindness. God says in the Holy Quran, verily the ends you strive for are diverse. And if God so willed, he surely could have made all mankind a single community, but he willed otherwise, and they will continue to hold divergent views. Indeed, of all the religious traditions, Islam is one that acknowledges God did not intend for all mankind to be a single faith. It is upon this principle that Islam was instituted, not upon the principle of homogeneity, which we often see imposed on Muslims today by groups, scholars, or governments who adhere to a very strict, literalist, and simplistic understanding of the faith. These groups do Islam a great disservice by making it seem as if the, it, we are primitive in our approach and unable to adapt to changes inherent in a social and cultural fabric of a new world culture that has come about by the advent of a globalizing technology. Early in Islamic history, a heretical group of Muslims known as the Khawarij asserted that they alone possessed the true understanding of the religion and that anyone who disagreed with them were unbelievers, despite their profession of the Islamic faith. Ali, the son-in-law and the cousin of the Prophet, the fourth caliph of the early Muslim community, considered this extreme aberration very dangerous and actually made it a crime for anyone to preach its tenets. However, he predicted that modern forms of this heresy would continue to plague the Muslim people throughout its existence. Whoever thinks that human beings must be identical, all adhering to a single system and one way is in fact an enemy of freedom and diversity and believes that a totalitarian ideal that is impossible to fulfill and that is strictly against Quranic teaching. It is contrary to the original spirit of discourse in Islam to stifle intellectual freedom and to debate the various approaches to law and society. Stifling debate is like imposing a dictatorship on religion, utterly confining its scope. The prophet said to his companions, the differences among you are a blessing. It is only through diversity that we're able to learn, for without diversity in thinking, competition is eliminated and humanity would fall to the lowest common denominator. Intellectuality requires competing stimuli and the exchange of ideas in order to function. The appearance of varied approaches is the fruit of mental and spiritual labor. Rather than restricting Muslims to keep to themselves, the Prophet encouraged them to learn from others. It is clear from his famous saying, seek knowledge even if it is in China. This statement and many others of it, like for example, be learners from the cradle to the grave. These endowed the Muslim nation with the drive to learn and seek knowledge even if it was not invented here. Based on the principle of diversity, we find the corollary in the freedom to choose a religious path. In the Quran, God said, there shall be no compulsion in matters of faith. The principle is so important in Islam that if a person converts by force, his acceptance of Islam is legally invalid. As an Abrahamic faith, Islam embraces Christians and Jews as monotheists and believers in the one God. In the Quran, God praises their prophets and says, who then sent down the book which Moses brought, a light and a guidance to man? We sent down Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law that came before him. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light and a confirmation of the law that came before him. The Quran further recognizes their holy books, the Torah and the Bible, as divine revelations to mankind and honors Christians and Jews as people of the book. The people of the book were afforded not only freedom of belief, but they were allowed to maintain religious laws and practice, even if they conflicted to the laws of Islam. Over time, additional groups were added and afforded similar rights. The major one of the major jurists of Islam, Imam Malik, opined that the Zoroastrians should even be treated under the same terms as people of the book. In the early 8th century, the first Muslim prince to rule India, Muhammad bin Qasim, vowed to protect not only Muslim mosques and shrines, but even Hindu places of worship. During the Arab rule of Sin from the 8th to the 10th centuries, Islamic law was adapted to include Buddhists as people of the book. During the Muslim empires of the past, people of the book were able to administer their own laws in lieu of Sharia. For example, they were allowed to consume food of their religion, 
even items that were prohibited in Islam, such as pork or wine. Even in social affairs, marriage, divorce, charity, non-Muslims had the freedom to govern their community as they wished without conditions or restrictions. The Prophet Muhammad himself respected the prophets who came before him. When they, him and his companions victoriously entered the city of Mecca, he ordered the destructions of the idols inside of Kaaba, except for one image which he protected with his hands. When they were finished removing the other images, he removed his hands to reveal the image he had carefully hidden. It was the child Jesus with his mother Mary. The image on the interior column was the only image that remained inside of the Kaaba. In addition to the Prophet's example, the Holy Quran commands Muslims to afford autonomy and the respect for world religions and, and practices. In chapter 109, verse 6, God says, unto you your religion and unto me mine. Muslim jurists have concluded for centuries religious freedom is a core principle of Islam. It is important for me to also highlight some historical examples of religious tolerance and support for non-Muslim communities after the time of the Prophet Muhammad to demonstrate that some of the current interactions between Muslims and non-Muslims have greatly diverged from their historical roots. Whether it's the destruction of Christian holy sites in Egypt, the demolition of the Buddhist statues in Afghanistan, or the mass exodus of Christians from Iraq, the despicable violence against these communities is antithetical to the legacy of pre previous Muslim societies. Unfortunately, some Muslim leaders and fringe groups are greatly damaging the reputation of Islam and the way the world views Islamic law and our notions of justice. So I would like to run through these examples of social cohesion and compassion and justice in Muslim societies, which provides Muslims with the evidence they need to reverse the tide of interreligious enmity and, mal and malvolence, and also provides non-Muslims with the hope and the assurance that such balance and harmony could someday return. In 628 AD, the Prophet Muhammad wrote a letter granting a charter of privileges to the monks of St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai. An early example of religious freedom and tolerance towards Christians, it ensured several human rights, including the freedom of worship and the freedom of movement, and the exemption from military service and the right of protection of war. The entire text is as follows. This message is from Muhammad ibn Abdullah, as a covenant to those who adopt Christianity near and far, we are with them. Verily I, the servants, the helpers, and the followers will defend them because Christians are my citizens and by God I hold out any, against anything that displeases them. No compulsion is to be on them, neither are their judges to be removed from their jobs nor their monks from their monasteries. No one is to destroy their houses of religion, to damage it or carry away from it anything to Muslim houses. Should anyone take any of these, he would spoil God's covenant and disobey his prophet. Verily, they are my allies and my secure charter against all that they hate. No one is to force them to travel or to oblige them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for them. If a female Christian is to marry a Muslim, it is not to take place without her approval. She is not to be prevented from her church to pray. Their churches are to be respected. They are neither to be prevented from repairing them nor the sacredness of their covenants. Not, no one of the nation of Muslims is to disobey this covenant until the day of judgment. Next, the ruler of the fourth Khali, the ruler, Khalif Ali, of the, of, uh, he was the fourth ruler of the empire. He wrote a letter to his companion, Malik al-Ashtar, and these are the words of that, of that letter. Remember, Malik, amongst your subjects are two kinds of people, those who have the same religion as you have, and they are brothers to you. And those who have religion other than yours, they are human beings just like you. Many men of either category suffer from the same weaknesses and disabilities that human beings are inclined to. They commit sins, indulge in vices either intentionally and unintentionally or foolishly, and don't even realize the enormity of their deeds. Let your mercy and compassion come to rescue and help them in the same way and to the same extent that you expect God to show mercy and forgiveness to you. You must always appreciate and adopt a policy which is neither too severe or too lenient. A policy which is based upon equity will be largely appreciated.
And interestingly, this letter was used in 2002 by the UNDP as an example of good governance for the Arab world. Next, under the Umayyad Caliph of the 9th century, the heartland of the Muslim empire was southern Spain, or Andalusia. This region played an active role in promoting multicultural learning and religious tolerance. Christians, Jews, and Muslims lived in peaceful coexistence, and Christians and Muslims used to pray together in the great mosque of Cordoba. It was at this time that the writings of ancient Greek philosophers were preserved and translated by Muslim scholars. Non-Muslims living in Andalusia were not forced to live in ghettos or segregated places. They were not prevented from practicing their faith. They were not forced to convert or die under Muslim rule, nor were they banned from any particular ways of earning a living. Not only were Jews and Christians able to contribute importantly to society and culture, but they worked in all branches of civil service. The tradition of religious liberty continued for centuries, and the Sultan of Morocco, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Abdullah issued the following edict on February 5, 1864, to advise Moroccan governors how to treat their Jewish populations. To our civil servants and agents who perform their duties as authorized representation of our territories, we issue the following edict. They must deal with their Jewish residents of our territory according to the absolute standard of justice established by God. The Jews must be dealt with, with by the law on an equal basis with others so that none suffers the least injustice, oppression, or abuse. Nobody from their community or outside shall be permitted to commit any offense against them or their property. Their artisans and craftsmen must not be scripted into service against their will and must be paid full wages for serving the state. Any oppression will cause the oppressor to be in darkness on Judgment Day, and we will not approve any such wrongdoing. Everyone is equal in the sight of our law, and we will punish anyone who wrongs and commits aggression against the Jews in our community. This order which we have stated here is the same law that has always been known and established and stated. We have issued this edict simply to affirm and warn anyone who, mis who wish to wrong them so the Jews may live in a greater sense of security and those intending harm may be deterred by a greater sense of fear. These edicts and practices are part of the real legacy of Prophet Muhammad to civilization. From these examples, it is evident that the hardline Islamists today are making up a different faith. Moreover, their calls to revert back to the Islamic practices of the seventh century are entirely false because they have no intention of following the earlier Muslim communities' examples of interfaith tolerance, acceptance, and peaceful coexistence. It is also significant to note that many of the worst examples of Muslim and non-Muslim tension are occurring in modern times after the advent of this militant Islamist doctrine. Even within the sensitive field of Islamic law, Muslim jurists are open to learn from their Christian and Jewish counterparts. The Quranic exegesis, exegesis known as the Israeliyat emerged from such conversations. The experience of being around knowledgeable Christian and Jewish scholars who debated, analyzed, and rigorously critiqued the laws of religion helped the Muslims develop their own sacred law in which they were able to answer hard theological questions and counter theological attacks. This led the Muslims to develop the classical systems of Islamic jurisprudence that have influenced the practices of Islam until today. In short, Muslims historically found themselves immeasurably enriched by knowledge, experience, and wisdom of other communities and traditions. And the greatness of the civilization they once built was very much influenced by that sharing. In a way, we can see that the Muslims actively manifest the Quranic commandment to know the other and to compete in the pious race to do good work. In terms of religious liberty for both men and women in Islam, the sacred law has a rich tradition of gender, of gender equality. There is no distinction between man and woman. Both have the same rights and obligations and are promised equal rewards in heaven. Even though the principles of equality are illuminated throughout the Quran, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, Umm Salama, once asked him why women were never specifically mentioned in the Quran. Soon after that, the following verse was revealed. Verily, for all men and women who have surrendered themselves to God, all believing men and all believing women, and truly all devout men and devout women, and all men and women who are true to their word, 
and all men and women who are patient in adversity, and all men and women who humble themselves before God, and all men and women who give in charity, and all self-denying men and all self-denying women, and all men and women who are mindful of their chastity, and all men and women who remember God unceasingly. For all of them, God readied forgiveness and sins, forgiveness of sins, and a tremendous reward. Although Prophet Muhammad taught his community by example to respect and honor women, this verse formalized the principle of gender equality and guaranteed several rights for women in a time and a place where women could have been thought of as just chattel. As prominent scholars, businesswomen, and activists, many women in the Prophet's family epitomized the symbols of moral excellence. Unlike the situation in many Muslim-majority countries today, these women were prominent figures in the public sphere. Moreover, they were strong pillars in the early Islamic society and served as role models for both men and women. Much has been written on their illustrious contributions from which we can learn from. Unfortunately, people have a very different impression of Islamic mandates on women. But the fact is Islam gave women rights and freedoms that were not realized in the West until the 20th century. These rights include the right to life free from female infanticide, the right to an education, the right to choose, reject, or divorce a husband, the right to own personal property exclusive of anyone else, the right to a dowry and to keep her family name after marriage, the right to run a business, a trade, and employ men, and to reserve and manage her wealth without a male figure. The moderate majority of Muslims believe that these rights are what help a community grow. Certainly, we can agree these rights are inalienable, much like, much like Thomas Jefferson's assertion of the human being's inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet, in some parts of the world, these God-given rights have been systematically denied to women by religious fanatics. Historically, Islam has not only established and supported universal principles of human rights, but it has also fostered tolerance and acceptance of different religions and cultures. Unfortunately, the Islam I'm describing for you, which is based on the example of the Prophet Muhammad, is virulently under attack. One of the greatest threats to the practice and understanding of Islam today are religious extremists who have misinterpreted its foundational principles. Although they constitute a very small minority of Muslims, they are actively framing the narrative of Islam as a religion of hatred, religious intolerance, and violence. Online and in the real world, it is difficult to separate fact from fiction. The inordinate attention extremists receive in the media has made them appear as if they are the predominant voice of Islam. Unfortunately, many moderate Muslims are afraid to challenge the extremists. As a result, the mainstream majority has all but lost its voice to a rabid minority who use their draconian interpretations of Islamic law as an instrument of oppression and war for their own political purposes. But there is a grassroots effort of Muslim communities around the world to reclaim the image of Islam as a religion that's equitable, just, and socially responsible. This is truly the struggle within the Islamic world for the very soul of Islam. However, we should be mindful that it is part of a long process that may take generations to unfold. Just as the West took centuries to progress from the world of Dante's Christianity to that of Martin Luther King, so too the Islamic world is in the midst of its own transformation. We must realize that if this process is to be truly organic, real social growth and development will take time. I hope that in the course of that time, the democratic reality of classical Islam, as it was practiced for centuries, will reassert itself and the middle way will prevail. It is interesting to note that today, the most widely read poet in America is the great Muslim Sufi poet Jalaluddin Rumi. He is and remains a perfect exemplar of the pluralistic Islam that I am describing and one that apparently finds sympathetic reverberations in the hearts of many. There have always been enemies of tolerance at the extreme ends of all societies. And the biggest danger is to allow their loud voices to win. In my work around the world with Muslim communities, I find the worrisome phenomena of faith communities becoming increasingly isolated from one another. Sure, leaders come together to dialogue, but then everyone retreats to their fellow believers, and that's often where the interaction ends. 
It is very important for there to be a focus on interfaith activism. People of all faiths need to come together, serve humanity together, break bread together, introduce each other to our families, and to concretely contribute to the social fabric of our societies. The media plays a big role per per perpetuating, perpetuating, perpetrating <laughs> negative stereotypes and feelings of antagonism, which lead people to avoid the other. People of faith need to help rebuild, and in some places actually create the bridges of cooperation if we want the principles of religious freedom to continue to flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hedia, for a, a wonderful overview, I would say in an optimistic vein of all the resources in the Islamic tradition supportive of tolerance and, and liberty. You've given us a lot to, to talk about, but before we uh, broaden the discussion and bring in the audience, I wanted to introduce two more panelists who uh, will share some of their reflections on our topic for about eight to 10 minutes. Is that all right? Uh, We'll keep you to that so that we can really throw things open for a wider a conversation. To my far right, we'll start with Rana Husseini, who's a journalist with the Jordan Times and a human rights activist. Rana has written extensively on honor crimes uh, committed against Jordanian women and is the author of a very important book on the subject, Murder in the Name of Honor, the True Story of One Woman's Heroic Fight Against an Unbelievable Crime. That book just came out in 2009. Uh, Rana has earned uh, some nine local and international awards, including a medal from Jordan King Abdallah II in 2007 for her reporting. Her work uh, contributed to the formation of the National Jordanian Committee to eliminate so-called crimes of honor in 1998. Let me also introduce Aziz Abu Sara who is a well-known peace activist, a Palestinian raised in Jerusalem, who's now here in the area as the co-executive director of George Mason University's Center for World Religions, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution. He served as chairman of the Parent Circle, a, a wonderful organization I think known to many of us here. Um, it's an organization of bereaved Israeli and Palestinian families. Uh, and Aziz has also received several important prizes for his work. I'll just mention a couple. The Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East from the Institute of International Education and the Silver Rose Award from the European Parliament. So thank you both for being here. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Rana. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, I know that everybody thanks <laughs> usually uh, in the conference, but I have to thank Dr. Kelly for including me in this important project. Um, and I was so happy um, to hear that there's something that uh, would uh, work to gather the three religions and to really work for something um, that would hopefully in the future eliminate extremism. Because as I see it now, it seems that we are really, really going towards um, uh, very extremist uh, world, unfortunately. I mean, um, I studied here in the US in the 80s and 90s, and I come back, and I see the amount of hatred, unfortunately, that uh, is building up against uh, Arabs and Muslims. Um, when Dr. Kelly sent me an email, uh, of course, I've been a reporter for uh, the Jordan Times and an activist on the issue of so-called honor crimes for 17 years. And throughout these 17 years, I felt that even this topic was being used uh, to label uh, uh, or to connect these kinds of murders to Arabs and Muslims. Of course, this increased after September 11th. Um, so I was so happy to, to, to be able to contribute a chapter to this book 
to explain really the, the seeds uh, and roots of these uh, um, uh, murders. And if we want to answer the first question, um, uh, I don't want to defend Islam because uh, Islam is very clear, or exa for example, on adultery. You have to have four witnesses. They have to be good witnesses. Uh, no one can take the law into his or her own hands. Um, but now, nowadays, what I see is always labeling that these crimes only occur in our part of the world. So one of the things that I wanted to uh, um, convey in my chapter was the fact that these crimes are really uh, not restricted to any country, religion, class, uh, you know, or uh, even a continent. <laughs> so um, uh, maybe, maybe the thing I want to highlight is the role of the media. We talk about the role of the media. Okay, um, when a person commits a crime, okay, if we talk about this issue in specific, when a person commits this a crime here in the U.S. or in in any part of Europe, this person is immediately labeled by his religion, okay. Especially if I'm talking about so-called honor crimes, or if a man kills his wife, it's immediately a Muslim man did this or that. On the other hand, if uh, uh, let's say another a non-Muslim, let's say, we don't want to label anyone, commits a crime, they are never defined by their religion. And I think this is one reason why we see this hatred happening. This is why we feel that, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I feel that people just want to believe that Muslims are evil. They cannot wait for something to happen to immediately la label it as Muslim, okay? The Virginia Tech shooting, if you remember, it was committed by a Korean. We never, any of you know the religion of the person? Never, ever. It was just a Korean. We don't know his religion. But when it's a Muslim, it's immediately this person is labeled as a Muslim. And the, and it, the roots go back to where he was, where he was born, so forth. So um, I want to jump to the last question, actions. I think, really, if we want to uh, get rid of this, we cannot get rid, actually. But if we want to minimize the damage of what is going on and the media and the way that we are being labeled, I would say we have to address things in a global manner. A lot of people tell me, how can you end so-called honor crimes? What can we do as foreigners? You know, there's always these questions. The answer is we have to un handle these murders in a global manner, okay? We cannot, we are not going to benefit anything if we come and say uh, a Muslim did this or, or a Christian did that. It's, it's not gonna serve a purpose. What's the purpose if we keep labeling people? If we, this is where we create hatred. This is, this is what I felt throughout my 17 years, observing, reading, uh, people coming in to, to interview me. I have researchers, journalists, uh, diplomats. Now everybody who comes to interview me, I can tell, I can sense what they really want, what's in their mind. So if we really want to try to end this hatred that we're seeing now, we have to stop to label people. We have to stop the labeling, okay? If we continue to say Muslims are bad, they kill women. They d I mean, of course, everybody kills. What's the, the percentage of uh, homicide in the U.S.? Do you know? 1,500 women are killed every year in the U.S. by their intimate partners. These are your figures, not our figures. <laughs> it's not my figures. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is how I, I see it. Um, and that's why in this chapter that I wrote, I basically uh, traced the roots of this uh, murder. It was actually, it was, I wanted to know. Everybody was telling me, what's the roots of these murders? Okay, I was born in 67, okay. Uh, was it only during my time that women are being killed? Is it, is it only in Jordan? I discovered uh, that really these crimes are not restricted. It wasn't, it didn't start in our time. It was, it dates back to the ancient civilizations. And if we trace history, throughout history, the Dark Ages, uh, in Europe and elsewhere, women were being killed, women were being labeled as sorcerers, uh, wise women were attacked by the church. I mean, I don't, I'm sure you're, you all know that. You're all scholars, you all know that. But I didn't know that. <laughs> and I know a lot of people didn't know that. So I basically traced all that until our day. And it, only, it doesn't only go on so-called honor crimes. It also goes on circumcision. A lot of people think that female circumcision or female genital mutilation, as uh, we activists like to say it, uh, that it's something that is happening now or it's only in Africa or in some part. It's not, it's not. 
it was also an ancient practice that was uh, practiced in all societies, not all, but I mean many uh, civilizations, let's say. Um, and I was shocked to read that it also happened here in the US, in uh, the UK, in Australia. It was happening until the early 1900s. So basically, in my opinion, I think that if we want to talk about, let's say, ending violence against women, we have to. And, and in relation to religion, of course, because uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how religion treats women. Okay, all religions treat women. I would say that um, uh, we have to always focus on the um, uh, truth about religion. Because another thing that we, we, we're facing these days is the twisting of religion, twisting, hiding facts. We face this in, in our religion. Uh, uh, as you said, okay, you have uh, extremists who are talking in the name of religion, and we all know that the minority it does not represent us. These minority does not represent us. But what can we do? We come here to the US, we get harassed at the airports. I was coming from Turkey, I was interrogated for half an hour why I'm coming to the US. Because my name is Arabic. Who's going to pick you up from the airport? Who's, I mean, <laughs> are you going to stay in the US? Uh, why are you going, you know, all these questions. We're, we're being harassed. And this is all because a small group is basically uh, uh, running our religion. And I think it's our role to stop this group, be it in rights of women, be it in our rights, uh, be it in the truth. We have to be brave about it. We have to be bold about talking about our religion in a positive way. And I'm glad we are here uh, to, share, to share this. I, I want to share this with you because it's really frustrating. It's really frustrating that every time I come here or I travel because my name is Rana Ahmed Husseini, every time I have to be harassed because of my family name and my father's name. This is really frustrating. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, do I look like a criminal? <laughs> okay, I'm tall, but it uh, doesn't mean. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, anyways, I would like to stop here and uh, hopefully. Um <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm so excited, uh, uh, you know, I, I was hoping that the book would be out now, but it's not. But um, I do hope that you will enjoy my chapter. <laughs> <laughs> took me around uh, one year <laughs> to research and uh, you know a lot of reading but no i think it's very important if we have to focus on the you know on 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 conveying the truth okay we have to focus on that really really if we don't if we continue to uh, look at labeling stereotyping i don't want to tell you about stereotyping the stereotyping we've been uh, um, we've been living forever Every time they want to talk about Muslims, they have to bring either a covered woman or a man with a big beard and show them in the worst, you know, uh, it's, it's really. And really, this has been uh, building up, building up, building up. And this is what uh, foreigners see about. Yeah, yesterday, uh, t uh, a waiter was telling me, you're from Jordan. I told them I'm from Jordan. Of course, they don't know what's Jordan. Georgia, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to. <laughs> I was like, I'll just, yeah, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm, it's farther than uh, Georgia, and it's, <laughs> so, <laughs> really, I mean, uh, I do, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be around uh, this very uh, tolerant uh, group, <laughs> and uh, I do hope that, uh, you know, <laughs> I hope you're all tolerant, <laughs> we'll see, <laughs> we'll see when the questions come up. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, really, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad to be the first one, and, it's done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so please, if you have any questions afterwards, uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to take them. Thank you. I cannot follow this uh, humor, so well, I'll try. Good luck. Um, uh, I've been going on a streak of bad luck. Sorry for being late. And it doesn't matter how early I leave. It just has to be. Anybody here from Virginia? Good. So you came late, too. Thank you. So it wasn't only uh, traffic. Traffic and flooding. You see, in Jerusalem, I normally blame the occupation. <laughs> if you're late, you can always say, especially if you're meeting with Israelis, all you need to say is, I was stuck in a checkpoint, and they better not say any word. <laughs> but uh, here, that is harder to say. Although I could claim the border control. Um, 
I want to actually uh, come from a different place to this. My work is mainly focused on religion and conflict resolution, but um, maybe talk about my own also experience because I, I didn't grow up very tolerant. And I think there is uh, something to talk about that because when you think of Muslims and Islam, you might think, well, Muslims define Islam. And that is one, I think, of the biggest mistakes people do. So for my own actions as somebody who grew up in a very conservative Muslim house, uh, for people sometimes to define the actions I did as um, defining of what Islam is, is, is a problematic. And I think that's the mistake that often keeps going on is, is people actions who grew up Muslims or define themselves as Muslims being attributed to the religion to Islam. So I grew up in a Palestinian, um, as I say, conservative home. My family, very religious. My cousin is the preacher in the Aqsa Mosque which means he watches over every little mistake I do that is, he thinks is not good and it's problematic. So that's the school I went to, actually. I studied in, inside the mosque um, growing up. Um, incredibly good education, a lot of focus on, on religion. But when I was 10 years old, um, my brother, when I was nine years old, my brother Taysir was arrested from our home by Israeli soldiers and he was taken to prison where he refused to confess that he threw stones at Israeli cars and he was subject to torture, which eventually he was sentenced for one year in prison and a uh, few days after he was released from prison, he uh, passed away from injuries from the, the torture in, in prison. I was 10 years old then and you really struggle when you're 10 years old with such a thing. And the feeling I had at that time, it didn't have to do anything with religion, regardless of all the studies I did. And, and I studied everything that I talked about, about tolerance and about people and how you treat Jews and Christians. But at that moment, it didn't matter because it was personal. And when things get personal, you, you often l lose these morals and things y you studied. Um, I felt at that moment as if, uh, Somebody punched you in the face. When somebody punches you in the face, what's the first thing you want to do? Come on, be honest. I know it's about tolerance <laughs> place, but when somebody punches you in the face, what's the first thing you do? I would run. Yeah, yeah you, you <laughs> <laughs> also, but you, you punch back. How many people you know when they punched in the face, they take a step backward and they say, let me think about this logically and think what is my faith telling me about what to do? What's my morals? What is not many of us do that. Most of us, if somebody punches you in the face, you want to hit back. And um, that's exactly how I felt, and that's what I grew up doing. I grew up until I was 18, very active politically. I joined the uh, Fatah Youth Movement uh, very young, became one of the leaders. I became one of the writers on, um, against anti-Israel, if you wish. I never met an Israeli or Jew who wasn't uh, a soldier or a settler. and. I, I mobilized people to go protest. As I said, I wrote a lot of stuff I'm not uh, proud of. But when I look at that time, when people look at my work at those moments, they often would attribute it, as, as mentioned earlier, to, to Islam or to Muslims. When it had nothing to do, regardless that I went to the mosque five times a day, that I prayed, that I did all of that, it had literally nothing to do with Islam, but I still was a face of Islam uh, falsely. And this is true in every other aspect. I think it's amazing you mentioned how the media shows um, Islam in a specific way. Uh, recently, though, after bin Laden was, uh, was killed, there was a video that surfaced in, in the internet and it said that the Imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, is, for or is against America for killing bin Laden and he's speaking against uh, America, and then they show you a video. And so I was all concerned because that's my cousin, and I didn't know him to be a radical. So I, I looked at the video, and it's, it's basically this guy inside the Aqsa Mosque, true. This guy who's not the imam, who doesn't work for the mosque, he just has a big beard. And apparently, if you do have a beard, I'm going to go with the name Mullah from now on because I, I do have a beard. Uh, you become the imam of the mosque. And this guy stood up and started saying, well, America this and America that. And there were five, ten people sitting there listening to him out of 200,000 people who go to pray there. Okay, he got 15, 20 people to listen to him. Yet that became the headline of different news agencies of saying the imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque condemned, uh, or condemned America for killing bin Laden, said he was a great uh, imam. 
Um, recently, I received a, a very interesting email saying, uh, check the Quran, your Quran, nine, Surah 911. So I read what this says, and it says, well, Surah 911 talks about the eagle and how the um, people going to attack the eagle, and the eagle will come and conquer people. Now, I read the Quran a few times, and maybe I'm wrong, you can tell me, but I never read about an eagle in the Quran. So I read that, and you know, and it's being forwarded, you know, these chains of forwarded emails, and it's being forwarded of be aware, Muslims attack, demographics, you know, they're growing too fast. I have another thing I wanted to say, but I won't have to control sometimes. Um, it's funny, though. Um, uh, no, I'm trying to be appropriate. I do work in a university, too, so uh, anyway. But you know, it's, it's incredible. I open the Quran, and I figure out Surah 911. Of all Surah, of all verses, it talks about compassion. Yet, in that email, it was about us being violent people. Now, the, the problem that we face, I think, as the Muslim community is not that the Quran or the Hadith has enough sources to show that Islam is compassionate or Islam is against violence. It's not that that's absolutely not the problem. There were many, many verses mentioned here, and there are so many more. One of the fun things I do, I work with with a lot of uh, imams across the, the Muslim world. And one of the fun things to do is to sit down and just start each one reciting different verses from either the Quran or the Hadith, trying to see all these verses that talk about tolerance. And there are so, so many of them. But the problem is how you communicate those to the average person, both in America and in Europe, and also in the Arab and Muslim world, because we are facing a radicalization, groups of Muslims who do want to come and say, well, Islam is about conquering the, the world, which, which, which is not, as, as again mentioned. So the problem, how do you really do that? How do we um, change the perception? Because facts are one thing, but the perception are more important often than actually what facts are. And that's, that's my work within, within the conflict resol resolution realm, is translating those verses to what everybody else know. And uh, it, is, it is a struggle. I've been, as I said, working with many imams across the Muslim world and figuring out ways, uh, using the media a lot more, using social media a lot more. Journalism, trying to work with actual journalists and changing that level of uh, animosity against uh, Muslims. Um, trying to also reach out to media here. Because when, for example, when the Norway uh, terrorism attack happened in in Norway, every media pretty much around, it blamed it right away on Islam. And it wasn't just any small media outlets. I mean, you're talking about Washington Post, and you're talking about the Atlantic, and you're talking about Fox News, although that might have not been a surprise. But it was blamed right away on Muslims when uh, my, one of my favorite comedians, uh, Stephen Colbert, said they rushed too fast to inaccuracy, so let us not be too fast to rush, to rush to accuracy, which after they figured out the facts, they were very, well, maybe it wasn't Muslims, but it was Muslim-like attack. You know? So if it wasn't Muslims, it's still somewhat uh, connected to us. And I'll end with the last questions here about interfaith dialogue. And I think interfaith dialogue is very important, but also is very dangerous. Um, I've been a critic, somebody who work a lot in interfaith, my, my co-directors in, in the center are both Jews and one of them is an Orthodox rabbi. And one of my, I think it's important, but I think often we avoid asking hard questions in interfaith meetings. And that's a mistake because then it becomes a fake meeting of us coming, hugging, eating good hummus, if it's made by the Palestinians. Um, <laughs> but not really targeting the issues. So y we have to be honest and we have to be open about what do we think if we want to really reach a true uh, dialogue. Um, in one of the meetings of the parent circle, I'm probably gone over my time. Right? In one of the meetings of the parent circle, uh, my dad was there and just like normal parents, they embarrass their children all the time. Um, and uh, Nur Nurit was there. and. Um, my dad raised his hand in, a, in the conference and said, well, if we're going to be honest, I have questions also. And, you know, I knew something bad is going to happen. <laughs> and he said, well, I've always heard about the Holocaust, 
but I don't know if it really happened, and I don't know anything about it. And you know, if, if you know Israelis, if you know Jews, this is one topic you don't touch. Yet for a Palestinian, it's something we never learned about, and it was important that somebody says, don't assume that I know it, and don't assume that I'll believe that it happened just because I'm supposed to, because it's politically correct. If you want me to know, then talk to me about it, and let's open the issues and hear what I've heard, hear the perceptions I have. We have to come to religion also from the same perspective and say, you know what, let's hear the different stories. Let's see what, what's about the whole jihad thing in Islam. I want to hear about that. Hey, what's about go and kill every man and woman and children in the Torah? I want to hear about that. What did it mean? How do you interpret it? Unless we're willing to target these issues, we're not going to really have a true interfaith dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rana and uh, Aziz. Um, that's a wonderful transition to a wider conversation. The very purpose of this conference is to speak uh, openly in a spirit of truth about some of these difficult questions, and not just speak from the podium, but uh, engage in a wider debate with, with the audience, with those of you who come out. So we, ha we have 40 minutes or so for such a conversation. So rather than keep talking amongst ourselves, why don't we take one of the mics and Aaron will um, uh, give you the mic, and I'd ask you if you have a question. All right, we'll share this one up here. If you have a question, stand up. The acoustics here will be fine with the mic, but do let us know your name, and uh, if you have an affiliation, what that is, for a bit of context, and try to keep the questions brief so that we have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Thank you. I w it was Aziz who just spoke? Yes. My name is Lenny. Uh, I'm just an independent. Uh, I was not clear on your, your thing about the Holocaust. Uh, because you did not learn about it, are, are you doubting that it existed? Do you have uh, questions about its authenticity? I did, growing up, ask about it because I knew nothing about it. So growing up until I was, I don't know, 17, 18, I knew nothing about it. And when I, um, when I saw meeting Israelis, and my first interaction with Jews who, again, weren't soldiers or, um, or settlers, that's one of the things I figured out. If you want to have real peaceful relationship with somebody, if you want to understand how to talk to them, you have to learn their history and you have to learn it from their point of view, not yours. I'm tired of people coming to talk to me about Islam, but they read only normally, not a one Muslim author. So what I did, uh, when I had those questions is took myself to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, and I learned about it. Um, I got Schindler List and watched the movie. And no, I don't have doubts about the Holocaust uh, now because I learned about it. I didn't have doubts before, but I knew nothing about it before. All I knew is, all I thought of is it's used against Palestinians. That's the only thing that normally got in my mind. And going to the Holocaust Museum was a very important experience. But I think it's, it's, again, something we all have to do is figure out how, how we can go and learn something about the other that might be not easy for us to learn. Because for Palestinians to sympathize with Israelis is very, very hard because we have conflict with each other. And to take that step, it was one of the hardest. I can refer you to an article I wrote about it at Haaretz. It's called uh, Palestinian Remembers the Holocaust. And you can, you can read more of the details about it. Thank you for the clarification. Good morning. Mike Rounds with Booz Allen, following 31 years with the FBI, uh, mostly around counterterrorism, the last decade of which I've spent trying to figure out how to better connect the community with law enforcement in particular, homeland security, and get to where we want to get to without the diatribe and the vitriol and the rhetoric on both sides. And it's, I appreciate your honesty and your integrity and your sincerity having come yesterday, ironically, from another Georgetown forum. At, the Center for Christian Christian Islamic Understanding, which in my view was a, uh, a complete attack on the government. I didn't see any understanding at all. But then left last night, the Homeland Security Policy Institute, and listened to Fox News um, pretty much berate the FBI for not doing enough. So my question to you following that, to each of you, is what are we, the community and law enforcement, even though I'm out, I'm still very much engaged, what are we not doing? with as much specificity as you can bring to your answers. What are we not doing 
that especially on this weekend, we should not only think about doing, but do. Uh, I, I think it's a really difficult question. Uh, you know, Mike, you and I talk about this all the time. I, I, I think for me, I, I would like to see, and Rana touched about this a little bit about the growing hatred of, of Muslims. And I think what I worry about most is, and it's been reported in the news as well, is the, um, the training that's going on to law enforcement and they're training them by um, illegitimate sources and, it, and it's actually fueling the hatred against Muslims. So I think it's really important that law enforcement meet with real Muslims. And, and I mean, meet not just in a large setting, but actually, and one example I have that I know personally is the LAPD, their engagement officers are breaking bread with Muslims, going to their homes, meeting them, talking to them. And I don't mean just leaders so they're hearing uh, a particular rhetoric, but actually community members so that they get a sense of the people they're policing and the issues that they're confronting and how to better communicate and engage with that community. And I think that only comes from familiarity and from understanding. And I think that, that I, I'm worried about the community being isolated from law enforcement and law enforcement being inundated with these negative stereotypes about Muslims and then that relationship becoming harder and harder to build. It's most of what I wanted to say, but I think if, if Muslims feel targeted, then they're not going to cooperate with uh, FBI. And you have some good example of in Virginia where families called uh, the families of the five students who went to uh, Pakistan who called the law enforcement and said, our children have, are being radicalized. We need your help. So you have some good examples of Muslims who do cooperate, but it can't be in the level of Muslims feeling always targeted, that we are the bad boys here and somebody's always watching over us. Um, I know I've... I've I've talked to Muslims who feel going to the mosque now is a scary thing because they don't know if the person next to them is a Muslim or an informant. And that's, or, or, a, or a terrorist. <laughs> because if, well, if it is a terrorist, then your whole community, like th there is one of the biggest mosques in, in, uh, in Virginia, in, Al in the F Alexandria area, where uh, Falls Church area, where you had a terrorist come out of that group, and then you have 40,000 people who go to pray there, and everybody's thinking, am I going to be now a target of uh, interrogation? So you have to reach out to people in, in a different way and not fe make them feel targeted. I think another thing is, I think there is a change of uh, the training that needs to happen. There is no conflict resolution training for FAI that I'm aware of, and I think having real Muslims go and talk, I know a couple people who do some trainings, uh, to, to FBI agents, and normally it's Muslims who are angry about Islam. And you can't have those people come and talk to you because all they're going to tell you is how awful and evil and bad those Muslims are. And then I wouldn't blame them, the officers, for being mad at me when they stop me for whatever uh, reason. Um, I, I think they answered everything uh, <coughs> because they lived in the U.S. I, um, I think that... Uh, you have to, first of all, you should discriminate. And there's discrimination, whether we like it or not. Uh, especially, I'm talking about inside the US. Uh, I'll give you a small story. Before, uh, I think in 1999 or two, something, sometime before September 11th, I wanted to, uh, I studied in the US for six years. I come a lot. I, okay. One time I came uh, on a, there was this co uh, program called Visit USA, whereby you buy a ticket, you go to five places for $300, $400, okay? And I bought it on US Air. I will never, ever travel again until now. I will never, I'm always profile every time I'm randomly selected by US Air. Every time. Every, I went to five places uh, until now, okay? And, and before 2000, before September 11th, Every place I went, obviously I'm a tourist, okay, buying the cheapest ticket, you know, the people who did September 11th b all bought one-way ticket, okay? Buying this to every place I was profiled. Every place you were randomly selected, you were randomly selected. They tagged my bag. They, one time they took me away. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a problem with the profiling of people. Uh, 
I think that uh, that the choice of people. I mean, I'm I'm a, a a tourist buying the cheapest ticket, and I was profiled every time, taken out of, uh, you know. So I don't know. I don't know if this is something that you you want to consider. I don't know if this is, but I think. Uh, and I said I said something is going to happen because they choose the wrong people. They choose the wrong the wrong people to profile. I'm a female coming to enjoy my time in the U.S. and I get randomly selected every time. No, really. I mean, what? I don't know what's. <laughs> is there a way you can take me out of this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tori Bauckham from Truro Church, an Anglican church in Fairfax. Uh, Hadea, I loved your talk. My question, you summarized the history of uh, Islam tolerance. Is there a resource you would recommend for those of us who are educating ourselves on that history? That's my question. Other than my chapter? <laughs> <laughs> if you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other than my chapter, I think I would have to, if you, I, mean, I don't know it off the top of my head, because to tell you the truth, my researchers helped me with that. It took about four months combing through, you know, internet sources, paper sources, to pull yeah. each of those out. Not, I mean, uh, to reference the Quran now, we have computer programs to do that, but all the other literary works is basically, you know, the old-fashioned way. So none that I am familiar with off the top of my head, but if I go back to my research and ask them if they have one particular source that they would recommend, I'd be happy to forward that to you. I'll take a card from you and try to forward that to you. Um, there's a very interesting book I read recently. It's written by a Pakistani imam. I think it was just uh, published in English. And it's an answer to those who believe in terrorism is part of Islam and basically he lists every Imam Qadri so everything in Islam that actually goes against those arguments in details it's 600 pages book so it's really it's Sheikh Tahir Qadri last name spelled Q-A-D-R-I first name T-A-H-I-R um, and it's a, sui it's a if you google Qadri fatwa suicide bombing, you'll pull it up. And if you don't find it that way, they're, they're partners of ours. With, I'll, I can get you some. Further questions? Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Rabia Zaman. I'm the president of International Cultural Center. So I just wanted to let you know that we do have copies of this particular book that was mentioned. Yes, we do have. So if you are interested, please let me know your name, and I can mail it to you or deliver it to you all. Also, I have a question. And this, this is, um, might not be a very precise or concise question, but I, we were hearing about um, a theme of media and or misperception that is generated by media. Um, and somehow um, Muslims being uh, tagged in a certain profile because of actions of some of the people, et cetera, et cetera. So being a regular community member uh, and coming from the Muslim community, um, I would like to understand two things. One, what should be my role in trying to promote a positive image? And number two, how can we as a group together, try to counter this isolated, small, radical group that is presented so frequently in the media. How can we counter that as regular good Muslims who are moderates? How can we counter that? How can we engage the other community members? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that. I think, uh, I think what we have to do is just talk. Just um, this book that you spoke about, you know, you have to promote these things. You have to, uh, in my opinion, um, for example, in our part of the world, women, women back in, in the Prophet's time, peace be upon him, we had very, very active role. I always say, like, for example, we have to promote these women. We have to talk about what they did, okay? The same. We have to talk about what religion. Media is very important. We underestimate media, but we have to, we have to fight back. We cannot just sit and say this, this small group is controlling us. We cannot. We have to fight back, be it this conference, be it uh, in articles, be it in interviews, uh, in books, in chapters. This is, how, this is the, the only way to do it. Because other than that, if we keep quiet, they're going to continue to rule and spread their own uh, thoughts. Okay? And we have to focus. For example, this book is an important. I'm going to get this book. 
and try to, to get uh, everything positive that's being said to promote it. Uh, we, have to f we have to fight back. Uh, in my chapter, I talk about all religious uh, stands on uh, violence against women. Talk about, we have to promote, for example, I know that all religions, or let's say religious uh, leaders, are not very bold about talking about women's rights. This I've learned, you know, I've seen. We have to push these religious leaders. Find the moderate ones. I would say find the moderate religious leaders or the one who support uh, causes and push them, encourage them, you know. I think this is one way to do it because other than that, we cannot. If we, if we stand and say, oh, you know, we, uh, th th these are th saying things, we're going to lose. So I think this is one way to do it, just to fight back. Um, I, I agree. I think the, the way we describe it, describe it in conflict resolution is taking small positive actions and try to multiply it and make incremental change uh, through that. And you try to multiply it and then you try to also uh, publicize it. One of the problems of our work often, we have to always watch ourselves, is we can do a lot of good work, but then how much of it is really publicized? And then having other people publicizing it. To me, it's sometimes uh, discouraging when you read a, you know, once in a while, whatever news agency will print a really positive, good article. But when you check on how many, how many comments or how many times it was shared on Facebook, you find it to be the least. Because people read it and agree with it and see, oh, cool. Yet the, the violent ones, you find it 10,000 times shared or 20,000 times shared. So I think that needs to change is, is us doing our best to spread those stories, those good stories. And every one of us has a rule. The problem if we all think, I'm only one individual, what can I do? And if we think in this way, that's a difference and that's not going to make any difference. If each one of us does the little he can do, then, then something can happen, something can change. Also, practically speaking, I th we need to activate the passive. I was at a presentation yesterday where I heard uh, a Muslim community spokesperson say, you know, we can't gather the resources because our community doesn't have the money. Oh, that's not true. We are a very wealthy community. We just can't get people to contribute. I mean, the Muslim community is just passive about this issue. And some people are getting galvanized and they're being concerned, And uh, but we just need to get more people concerned. and, and the Muslims need to create their own civil society infrastructure in this country that's strong and viable, and they have to contribute to their own organizations. Uh, I mean, we can't expect other people to always float that for us. And, and on a, another note, I think individually, everyone in, along the same vein, Aziz, is that when there are bad articles or negative interpretations, everybody, including non-Muslims, to write back to the person being like, you know, that was a really bad article. You really shouldn't have framed the issue that way. Or just tweeting it, putting it on Facebook, putting it in the little comment section after you read an article, I think would help inform our media about how damaging it is to the reputation of people. Maybe I'd add a, a couple uh, reflections there as well. You mentioned non-Muslims, and I think it's important that this question be put continually to, to non-Muslims, and that's something we're doing at this conference. Also, it's interesting to think about institutions and their responsibility. U U.S. law enforcement came up Obviously, there are links with U.S. foreign policy. Um, another institution is the university, and uh, I think universities haven't done enough in fostering dialogues like this and in tapping into the, the real thirst of young people to learn about these different religious traditions. Engage in abstract dialogue, but also get together around particular projects uh, in the community and so on. Uh, one very hopeful sign has been that President Obama has reached out to college campuses, and if you haven't heard about this, I hope you will over the next year, and challenged college presidents to put together initiatives around interfaith and service. So linking up the dialogue with service to the wider community, tapping into some of our shared social justice concerns, uh, and working with young people, frankly, because it's 10 years after September 11th, a lot of things haven't gotten better, uh, to put it mildly, and educational institutions can help us to invest in the future in a systematic way. All right, we've got a lot of questions here. We still have a good amount of time. Uh, let's go to the far back and then move up. Hi, my name is Grace Said. I just wanted to ask a question on politics, really. How much of politics is involved in this intolerance, um, and specifically the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? So I'd like any of you to talk about the relationship between 
I, I think in the US this great Islamophobia um, and the relationship with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how much is politics in, involved? Well, it's in, in, in pol there are a lot of people in every country, I think, that use religion to advance political ideals. And that is true in Israel and Palestine, where religion is used by certain groups to advance uh, political um, extremism, even, or and it's then described as religious extremism, both, I think, on, on the Muslim side and on the Jewish side. But we can't also ignore that there is the other side. There is people who are using religion in a positive way. And if, if you look at, in the States, uh, the civil rights movement, nobody said we should keep the Bible out of it. Religion was heavily involved in Martin Luther King's Jr. Um, movement. And the same thing is in Palestine. One thing that actually, talking about good news, that's literally not written about much and hardly is described is how much Islam is involved in the nonviolent movement in, in Palestine. In these people who go out also motivated, you know, I talk, I, I know a lot of the nonviolent leaders there and I work with them. And so talking to them, there are some of them who are deeply religious and come to nonviolence deeply from a point of this is what Islam telling me to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what the prophet did when he was doing his, uh, his dawah, uh, when he started. He was beaten, he was uh, attacked, yet he didn't respond back in, in the same way. And this is a way of uh, struggle that is fully legitimate according to Islam. So I think we have to not, to, to not only think of religion being used bad in politics and think of religion also being used good to motivate people to make uh, a change. And in Islam and in Judaism, I think to some level, it is harder than Christianity to separate politics from, from religion. But I think to, when, it t when it comes on the higher level of politics, it is important. Um, I do not want a Palestinian state that is an Islamic state. And I think m most Palestinians would agree with me. That doesn't mean that those people are not religious. Not wanting an Islamic state doesn't mean that they're not religious. Uh, Palestinians are becoming more and more actually religious, uh, a religious community, but at the same time, they are staying away from wanting to, uh, to turn to, um, to a religious state. And, and the same is, is in other countries. I hear so much about how afraid Americans from Egypt, for example, and the Islamic Brotherhood, and if they take over, and it's, it's going to be over for peace. Yet, uh, I'll tell you, my, my two sisters live in Cairo. My two sisters are the two most religious people I know at all. And both of them would never vote for Islamic Brotherhood. So just assuming because Islamic Brotherhood using Islam, everybody's going to vote for them is, is only a scaring thing to tell the West, we need a dictator in Egypt, because otherwise we can't control those crazy Muslims. And that's a false premise. Ari Asherman, Rabbis for Human Rights. Uh, each of you, one way or another, in your presentations, uh, all indicated that uh, some of the things that you are opposed to in certain in certain places in Islam are corruptions of the true Islam. Uh, without giving away what what I'll say when we get to the panel on Judaism, I felt very envious because I could never say that. Uh, every time, every, for every every uh, quote or source that I can bring. People who believe very differently than me could bring an equally authentic uh, quote or source. So my question is, uh, when each of you in different ways uh, express that, was that a matter of your personal faith and belief? Uh, is there any kind of quote unquote objective way of talking about what the true Islam is? Uh, and how does one go about uh, determining that in, in your opinions? That's a very good question. Uh, Actually, there's, um, there's a whole range of scholars out there who would, who would very much say the opposite. You know, So th it, it does absolutely exist, and there are these very heated debates that used to take place, actually. Um, people would say, I mean, from the scholars I've spoken to, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there were very, even in Saudi Arabia, they existed where they would what we call Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, traditional Sunni scholars would debate the Salafi scholars 
um, and talk about the differences in the, in the tenets and the theological interpretations. Uh, but it seems like the, the spirit of debate has almost disappeared in the sense that the um, mainstream scholars are here and the hard, the hardline literalist scholars are over here and they just, they're not intersecting very much. And it's that spirit of debate and, de and deciding on um, uh, agree to disagree is disappearing. And so there, it, there doesn't seem to be that kind of, that discourse going on as, as it used to. And so that's really unfortunate. And I think really to ultimately solve the problem of extremism and terrorism, the Muslim community is going to have to have that conversation. I mean, even in this country, we don't have that conversation. You know, the scholars on each side don't really come together. And so I think if we really want to solve this problem, we're going to need to come together at some point. And so, I mean, I hope to see that in our future. Good. Um, in front of Arik, there was a question. Keep moving forward. Next. Thank you. Ken Dante, I'm not affiliated. I was at the Brookings the other day, and they did, of course, another 9-11 survey, which everyone is doing for the decade. But they indicated a couple of things, and if I have this correctly, uh, one was that in America, people are more accepting of Muslims than Islam. Usually, we think of it as either or. And they also pointed to kind of a trend in America. They pointed to the Catholic Church and also the Mormons, how originally there was a rejection of the groups because of certain practices, but especially with the Mormons, as they dropped certain practices, and I believe it was polygamy was one of them, they became more acceptable to the American mainstream to the point that 66% of Americans now approve of Mormons, which if you know our history was not the case 100 years ago. So I just wanted for people just to play with that seed you know, as we know each other and as we do actions with one another, we may become more accepting of the Muslim than of Islam, or is that a requirement that we have to accept the other person's religion in its entirety, or is it just the individual that we need to aim to? You should convert to Islam or other, el no. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for the true <laughs> I took the microphone maybe mainly to do that joke, but I'll, now I have to answer you. Uh, no, I think you, you're right. Things do change. It's, it's true for Jews, it's true for Catholics, it's true for Mormons, where in the beginning these communities were persecuted heavily. It's then true for African Americans, where it wasn't just knowing the person or was a racial issue. And this is the dangerous about how we framing the Muslim community here and how it's looked uh, looked upon. Uh, but reaching out to the communities and trying to build relationship between Muslims and Jews and Christians here, I think is important to accept one another. Now accepting the religion, I'm not sure what, what you mean by it. It's not that Muslims want um, Christians and Jews to <coughs> all convert and become Muslims. That's not the point, but it is respecting each one practices. It is respecting that Muslims need a mosque in a community where there are 50,000 Muslims. And we're not talking about just the 9-11 site. You know, everybody talked about 9-11 two blocks away. Oh, you can't build a mosque. But the same thing's happening in California. The same thing is happening in Tennessee. The same thing's happening in different cities around the US. Why do you need to build a mosque? Well, if you respect me as a person, if you respect somebody for being a Muslim, then you can't deny them having a place of worship. And that's a problem that. I'm sorry, but it's much more complex than that. It's not so simple. I hear people framing this constantly as black and white. You're either with us or against us. You're anti Islamic. You don't support the mosque. In America, it's more complex than that. It's become more strong. And I just have to really say that it's been discussed before by Bolivia and Georgetown. You're right, it's complex, but it's complex in every level. And I think uh, if we're going to talk about complexity, it has to be also fair complexity because when, when you go to the Arab world and Muslims there say, you know what, we, we have this issue with America, you say, hey, why is that? Well, it's true, we, you know, the West colonized you for so many years, but come on, get over it. That's normally what I hear when Americans come or Europeans or British or French come to the Middle East. Say, it's true, we destroyed your country, but come on, it's about time. It's 10 years have passed, and I think it's about time that 
the communities do get together and start overcoming these issues. Muslims are not guilty for what the bombers of 9-11 did. And the complexity comes uh, from those who believe that we all as a community have become guilty of what a few Muslims have done. I'm, again, I'm not talking about just the New York side. I understand the New York side had certain complexities to, to some people. But I'm talking about Tennessee. I'm talking about California. I'm talking about a school in Virginia that had a problem being expanded because Muslims are in it. So you're not just talking about New York. We're talking about a whole national issue within the US that you can't tell me you respect me as a Muslim if you're telling me you can't build a school for Muslims and you can't build a mosque for Muslims anywhere in the country. If you want to worship, worship in your home. That is limiting my freedom of religion. I'm not talking even about the 9-11 side. Because of the sensi sensitivity of it, I took that out. Yeah. Let's talk about the mosque in Tennessee. Let's talk about the mosque in California. Let's talk, and I, I do want to add though, when it comes to the 9-11 side, there were Muslims also in those buildings. And I think Muslims are as Americans when they hear as everybody else. And we need to remember that it wasn't only Christians and Jews who were killed there. There were atheists, there were Muslims, there were people from any religion. and. They have feelings too, and these families of those people have lost their children too. Thank you. Uh, try to get in as many questions as possible. Nick, and then here in front. Um, I, uh, Nick Walterdorf, um, one of the panelists later in the afternoon. I've got a historical question popping up, and it's probably much too big for an answer here, but maybe you can give us all some hint. Um, what happened? What happened to modern Islam? Islam of the last hundred years, fifty years, whatever, which brought us to this pass. I mean, that, that's a way of putting it. Um, stifled the discussions that you, Hadia, said were taking place and so forth. What? What happened? Okay. Okay. I, I, well, no, I mean, it, it's actually it's not it's not so hard to explain. I mean. I, out there, this may be hotly contested. I personally uh, am of the belief it's the advent of Salafism or the uh, Wahhabism, the growth of the the different um, the different interpretation of Islam that came out of uh, out of Saudi Arabia that basically changed the way Islam was perceived as a religion and, and, and scholarly pursuits. So it's a very literalist interpretation where they believe that you have to read the scripture and whatever it says, that's what it means. So they didn't allow for historical context. They didn't allow for abrogation. They didn't allow for discourse. And as a consequence, all the 1400 years of scholarship was disavowed and basically said it's heretical, it didn't interpret properly because it used all these other uh, methodologies and therefore we throw it away, we're starting fresh. It, uh, they also uh, abandoned the clergy and the learned scholars and said everybody can pick up the Quran and read it for themselves. So that's why, that's where you get where people pick up the Quran and they say, well it says, it says kill the Jews, we're gonna kill the Jews. So no, they don't, it, they don't allow for the historical interpretation that that was a report of battle. So that was a particular historical story about the prophet engaged in a battle with a Jewish tribe. It did not mean kill Jews wherever you see them for, the, for eternity. So, but they don't allow for the historical context. And so as a consequence, anyone, and they purposely were trying to do this after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and then the loss of that, what they perceived was that glory of the Muslim world, and their, and their attempts to try to regain it became, it turned from a theological pursuit to this totalitarian ideology that was spread around the world, and as a consequence now we're just kind of, it's a Frankenstein they created that they're now like, you know, deciding how they're going to deal with it on a real world scale, so. My two cents. Right here in front, and then we'll move over here. Hi, 
Um, I'm Kirsten Evans. I work with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in our relationship with the Islamic community in the United States. Um, and I just, this is a little bit of a comment as well as a question. I, I spent yesterday at um, the entire day at a, a press event uh, called Shoulder to Shoulder, which was an initiative of the Islamic Society of North America, an organization that the Catholic bishops have had a long standing relationship with for over 20 years. They're very warm partners of ours in dialogue, good friends. Um, and um, the Shoulder to Shoulder initiative was brought about last summer in response to uh, a lot, the rise in a lot of um, um, anti-Muslim, anti anti-Islamic rhetoric that was gaining sort of a, a sentiment in the uh, media. Um, Islamic Society of North America did a fantastic job bringing together, yesterday we had almost 40 representatives of, of major religions in the United States. The Catholic bishops were there, many Jewish organizations, Lutherans, evangelicals, etc., standing shoulder to shoulder with um, with American Muslims, basically saying, you know, we, as, as an organization and as a religion, we reject um, intolerance, discrimination based on religion in this country. Um, the website has over 100 examples of interfaith um, projects that have taken place around the country in defense of American Muslims. Um, from Christian Jewish Sikh, the World Sikh Council was there yesterday. Um, so I guess my question is, um, in many ways, I, I feel like the, um, I think the challenge, if you don't, if, if I could say, and I'm, I'm tapping into something you said, the challenge that you, even from my own work that I've seen that the Muslim community in this country has is really a challenge of bringing to the, to the forefront of American consciousness, it's sort of a PR challenge of bringing a greater awareness of all of the benefits that the Muslim community does bring to civil, civil society in this country um, and changing that perspective, changing that. Um, and do you know of or are you involved in any really sort of vast or broad grassroots um, projects from within the, the Islamic community or the Muslim community in, in the United States to really, I say, would say to counteract um, the negative Islamic perception, not just with a, 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 a reactionary, please don't discriminate against us, but really, okay, let's counteract this by doing something extremely constructive and extremely positive that's going to, over a period of time, really change the concept of what this culture and this people bring to the American experience and to the American society. It's a huge task. But I wonder if you if you know of anything that's really organized. Uh, one thing that uh, you I saw you maybe passing cards with Rabia behind you. She's president of the International Cultural Center, and that's actually one endeavor um, that uh, uh, my organization is a partner with trying to do, which is do exactly that: is move behind, uh, move beyond just dialoguing, move beyond um, defending one another in times of conflict, but actually getting involved in interfaith activism, which is the thing I, I mentioned, is that serving what the president is called on to come together and to serve humanity together. And I think it's really important that we start to do that because we know each other's face, we've decided we're gonna respect each other, now are we gonna break bread together? Are we gonna invite each other to each other's homes? Are we really going to become a community? And part of a cohesive society. I do a lot of work in England and it seems like everyone, I remember when there was this, everyone thought in the United States we would never have a homegrown terror threat. I remember 10 years ago when I was talking about this because of my work in England, everyone's like, oh no, no, no our Muslims are acclimated. It was, it's a funny expression law enforcement used to use, but it was, it was considered just un, unheard of because Muslims were so well adjusted. And, and we're only seeing the repercussions of that now. And, I, and I, when I go to England, I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm seeing that this progressive segregation and increasing isolation of Muslims from non-Muslims, that's why they're so concerned about community resilience, building cohesive societies. And I think we're seeing that now. When we talk to our children in our community, they're being um, bullied, they're being ostracized, they're feeling like they don't belong, they don't fit in. And so more Muslim parents are pulling their kids out of public schools. Um, and I think if, if we continue to go this way, we're going to have Europe's problem where the Muslims and the non-Muslims are at an increased social tension and that's a disaster. And I, I think if we want to avoid that, we need to come together in, in a 
activist, social, responsible way if we want to we want to protect our society and our communities. And there are yeah, efforts across the country trying to do that. Thanks very much. Um, as chair, okay. Our, as chair, I'm going to give you the mic, <laughs> but uh, then we'll very quickly gather maybe the last two questions I saw there, give the panelists a chance to respond so that we can get to the well-deserved coffee break. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, uh, another organization, the American Islamic Congress. Zainab was supposed to be here, but uh, she's not here. So that's another organization that you can. Ah, uh, she's here. Okay, sorry. Good to meet her. So let's just take uh, two quick questions, one after the other, and then the panelists can respond. Uh, Richard Fulton, American Jewish Committee. Hedy, good to see you after too many years. Uh, and I want to ask you a question actually relating to something you said about the growth of Wahhabism. Uh, one hears that whether through funding or ideological uh, uh, correlation, that regardless of where the rank and file of, of Muslims in the United States are, moderates who just want to go observe their faith, be part of the larger society, that the heads of institutions, of educational institutions, of, of communal organizations that speak for the larger community, that somehow they're more linked in to this Wahhabi philosophy than the, the kind of tolerant uh, philosophy and ideology that you, that you represent, which has two effects. One, the danger of those institutions becoming radicalizers and leading to just the kind of uh, attitudes among younger people that we're worried about. And second, that they become the interlocutors uh, that the government or that those of us who are involved in communal uh, work are, are referred to as who we should be dealing with, which is not going to provide an opening for those who represent a more uh, uh, tolerant and open perspective. So could you or any of the others speak to the reality of that perception and what we ought to be doing to respond to it? Thank you. Yeah, yeah we've been. One more question in the back. Is there one more? No? Thank you. This is my second question. Um, regard, regarding the question about um, what, can, what can we do to isolate the small minority of um, fundamentalists that have what I think is hijacked the religion, um, in the many hundreds of mosques in the United States, are there many imams that get up and speak against uh, like 9-11 and other atrocities that are committed in the name of Islam? Comment and a question and a slight challenge, but I think because of our geographical location, I am in Washington D.C. This is right before 9/11. A lot of the comments and frameworks really developed on the notion of terrorism, counterterrorism, security, and Western attitudes towards Islam. But as a non-Western voice who works in the Middle East and a human rights researcher, all of the questions I ask, or which needs to be really dealt with by Muslim activists and thinkers, are the treatment of non-Muslims within Muslim majority communities and, and serious levels of violence that happens. I mean, if you look at the numbers in Middle East and North Africa, the Christianity will disappear in pretty much eight years. So while it is, I think, in terms of radicalization and militant jihad paradigms of Salafi Wahhabi groups and anarchist groups, there is that discussion which is, I think, addressed a lot. But what I see not being addressed enough by Muslims in Europe and in America and Muslims by and large within the Muslim majority communities is that notion that actually um, non-Muslims and those who don't come from heterodox Islamic traditions such as Ahmadiyyas, even Sufis in a lot of places are persecuted and Muslim majority countries rank the top lists of um, countries with the serious limitations on religious liberty. So that is actually one theological and practical challenge for us to engage. Um, anyway. I can go on on that, but I just want to say. Well, I'm glad this is the first panel and not the last panel uh, today. We've raised a lot of big questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd ask each of the panelists to maybe spend one, two minutes addressing these questions or any other concluding thoughts you'd like to offer. Okay, real quickly. Problem with institutional Wahhabism. Uh, it, it still exists. I don't know what... Um, I don't know what non-Muslims can do about that. It's a responsibility of Muslims to create corollary institutions and other institutions that aren't influenced by those ideologies. They do exist, they're growing, they're small, they're nascent, but um, I think we're gonna get there. I'm, I'm very confident we're gonna get there. She, she mentioned, Rana mentioned Zainab. Uh, there's a number of other organizations out there that are trying to do their best, and I think uh, hopefully they'll be successful. To your point, 
the persecution of non-Muslims and Muslim societies is a terrible, terrible byproduct, I think, of the rise of militant Salafism and jihadism. And, and it's a very worrisome phenomenon to me. And when people you know, debate the issue of Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, I think we really need to be conscious of that fact because we don't want to see Christianity disappear from Egypt. And if we, if we allow hardline groups to take control because they're the most disciplined and the most politically savvy, uh, our, our world is going to look vastly different and it's a terrible tragedy. I think it's a problem of non-Muslims and non-Muslims alike that we, need, we really need to deal with. And to your point about imams, there are imams across the country that are condemning violence. Not enough. I'd like to see more. I, I was hoping that the National Security Council announced a policy on combating violent extremism through community partnerships. I was hoping for something a little more robust. Uh, I'd like to see the president actually challenge the Muslim community to do that, uh, to come out with some partners and say, look, you know, this is our, these are our partners against violent extremism. This is what the community is doing to kind of galvanize and push the community to do more. Right. I, I think uh, I completely agree. I think it also, though, uh, goes to how much these efforts are publicized. So how, ma how many here have heard really of the Muslims who did condemn violence? And there's lists. I mean, it's easy to even search, go to Google and put the list of imams who condemn 9-11 or, 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 and you'll find tons of them. However, this is not newsworthy often to, to any news agency for, for whatever reason it is. I mean, you had a group of uh, imams in the US here who went to Auschwitz talking about the Holocaust. Uh, and shown sympathy and wanted to learn and talked about it and still that hardly made it. I, I would assume most of you have never heard of that. So there are efforts. I'll, I'll tell you one, one of the initiatives I, I started in Israel, Palestine is, is taking uh, groups to, to the region, to the Middle East, but mainly Israel, Palestine, where they study the, something we call dual narrative, the narratives of the area learning from Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and instead of having the normal one guy thing, we, we have two or three, depending on the group. And we took interfaith groups that did incredible work. And again, that wasn't something, uh, uh, slowly it's becoming actually a media interest, but originally it took a lot of work to get it normally on, on the media. So th this stuff, it, it goes back to how much we're able to publicize those positive uh, increments. <clears throat> Finally, me, last but not least. <laughs> Again, uh, I, would, I would stress uh, uh, on the media. This is very important. The other thing I would like to stress is the education. Uh, I'm glad that President Obama focused on that. I'll give you a very small uh, example. It's uh, scary, but uh, keep that in mind. And uh, I hope this will change in the future. Two years ago, uh, I came here on a book tour for my book. And I went to Boston College. And I was, uh, there was a group of students, around 20 or 30 students, and I was uh, talking about the issue of so-called crime, saying it happens in all religions, talking in a very, a very general and objective manner. And when I finished, one of the students raised her hand and said, uh, she, she asked me, uh, you're, me, you're saying that these crimes are not part of Islam? I said, no, they're not. She said, but that's strange, because our professor, we are taking a class in Sharia and Islam, and she asked us to come and attend your, uh, your uh, lecture, meaning she's thinking that I'm gonna come and Islam, Islam, Islam. And she was disappointed. And of course, all the students left, nobody bought the book, nobody was interested. I don't care if they don't buy the book. But <laughs> no, really, because my, I, I, I'm trying to spread the truth. I'm trying to spread the reality about this issue. And this is really scary when a student comes to you disappointed because the, her professor told her that you know you're coming, you're going to hear a radical feminist crazy woman who's gonna slam Islam, and this is not the case, and that's what they are being taught in universities. This is really scary, and this should make us all think about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you all for for being part of this first panel. I think we've gotten off to a great start. We'll have about a 10-minute break, and then I'd like to welcome you back for our next panel. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking this round of panelists.